We are now recording. This is the third of the third lecture on the digestive system, and we are on the third uh, power third and final PowerPoint slide. So we begin today by talking about one of the accessory organs of the digestive system. As a reminder, the accessory organs of the digestive system are not part of that uh, long tube that connects the oral cavity to the anus, but because they do something, often produce something that helps with digestion, they are considered uh, and they are considered part of the digestive system. Uh, just an accessory organ of the, of the digestive system. So we've spoken about the pancreas before, actually, in the endocrine unit way back when, seems like now. So back then, we talked about the endocrine portion of the pancreas, which is focused on the islets of Langerhans, where you'll find alpha and beta cells, which make glucagon and insulin, respectively, to help regulate blood glucose levels. Now we revisit the pancreas, specifically its exocrine portions from... So from a histological standpoint, we focus on the pancreatic acini, essentially the C around those islets of Langerhans. The exocrine portion of the pancreas produces digestive enzymes, which contributes to the pancreatic juice. And this digestive, uh, these digestive enzymes, pancreatic juice does not have to go very far. So the pancreas is located next to the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine where most digestion and absorption will occur. Because digestive enzymes don't have to go very far, they do not access, they do not need access to a bloodstream. Uh, they instead only need access to a duct, and that's what they indeed have access to. It's called the pancreatic duct. It essentially is what allow is what will allow um, digestive enzymes to travel from the pancreatic acini and to the duodenum, where most digestion and absorption will occur. Now, uh, when it comes to pancreas anatomy, there's a head which is nice and round always, always facing the duodenum. Typically, this is located on the right side of the patient. And then on the left side is going to be a pointy tail, and then anywhere in between is the body of the pancreas. Those regions are worth knowing. Uh, please realize that the pancreatic islets are just First, evenly throughout the pancreas, uh, and so is so, so are the pancreatic acini, and so that's why the pancreatic duct travels throughout the entire pancreas, making sure that no digestive enzyme is left behind. Uh, otherwise, it would be a waste of energy making digestive enzymes that don't actually go to the duodenum. Involved in, or what's found in the pancreatic juice are three main enzymes we've actually seen before. So uh, pancreatic alpha amylase, we saw salivary alpha amylase found in the saliva. Uh, so I reiterate that it's important to specify where you're finding the amylase because they're not exactly the same thing. This one's a carbohydrate. So it starts breaking down or not starts, but it continues to break down starches. Salivary amylase is what, is what will begin the breakdown of starch in the oral cavity. There's also pancreatic lipase, not to be confused with salivary lipase, which we saw uh, in the oral cavity. Lipases will break down complex lipids, uh, essentially into a smaller form that will make it a little bit easier for the brush border enzymes in the duodenum to take, to take care of. And then there are proteolytic enzymes. These ones will break down proteins into peptides, and then eventually amino acids. Uh, these are secreted as proenzymes. So trypsinogen is a good example. It gets activated, uh, activated into trypsin. That's the active form. Uh, and then it will, it's activated when it meets the brush border enzymes that are in the small intestines. Now, the next accessory organ we're going to talk about with respect to the, with the, respect to the digestive system is the gallbladder. Uh, the gallbladder is primarily responsible for storing bile. Now, uh, something to appreciate and understand when it comes to digestion, between the three macromolecules, 
the three being carbohydrates, uh, lipids, and pr proteins. Uh, lipids uh, pose a different, a significant challenge when it comes to digestion because you've got a water-based chyme, uh, and uh, lipids uh, don't mix well in water-based chyme. And so uh, lipids will need bile, which is stored in the gallbladder, to help with the process of emulsification. Uh, and if you're a baker, you'll, I think, a, a more easily appreciate this. If not, then uh, simply emulsification is the process by which we add an emulsifier. So bile is an emulsifier, and it makes lipids a whole lot more easily solvable um, in, it helps it mix easily, a lot more easily in, in water, which is what we want in order to maximize digestion and absorption of all these nutrients in the duodenum. So bile uh, is stored in the gallbladder. And something I really want to reiterate for you, especially as we move on to the rest of the urinary system in two weeks, if not the end of next week, uh, it, it, ha it, it has to do with the concept of, of a bladder. So uh, you have to specify uh, what bladder because uh, there's a urinary bladder, which also uh, only stores fluid, specifically urine. So the gallbladder is a storage vessel only, meaning uh, it stores only, it makes nothing. Therefore, bile has to be made somewhere else in somewhere else that's nearby so that it can easily get to the gallbladder for storage. And gallbladder uh, stores bile that, may, that is made in the liver that happens to be right above that gallbladder. So in a nutshell, bile is made in the liver but stored in the gallbladder. It is a bitter fluid. It is greenish yellow. Um, in appearance. And so something that we consider uh, when uh, a patient is uh, experiencing uh, frequent vomiting is we ask for, or we look for the color of the vomitus, because if it tends to be a greenish yellow fluid, then the chances that bile is included in there is higher. Uh, and that would certainly hone that would certainly encourage us to hone in and what, what, on what might be happening in the gallbladder. So uh, again, the main function of bile is to emulsify. Let's talk about certain conditions that uh, come, that, are, that stem from the gallbladder. Gallstones, gallbladder stones are a uh, pretty frequent, unfortunately. Uh, it's known as cholelithiasis. So here we have an accumulation of uh, cholesterol and calcium deposits in the gallbladder. Here are the stones right here. Look how painful that possibly can be. Um, and uh, now it becomes a, an even bigger issue when these stones leave the gallbladder and are traveling through the cystic duct or any of the ducts really, because that movement of stones can cause uh, obstruction and that would certainly cause backup, which would contribute to discomfort and pain. The biliary tree is something worth, you know, worth uh, spending some time on because bile is made in the liver. It's got to find a way to get to the gallbladder for storage, but it's also got to find a way to get to the duodenum when it's needed because there are fatty acids present in the, in the food that was just taken in. So there are two lobes of the liver. We'll talk about uh, a little bit more later on. The right lobe, which is larger than the left lobe. Each lobe of the liver has its own hepatic duct. So this would be the right hepatic duct. This would be the left hepatic duct. They come together to form the common hepatic duct. And then this is basically the network of ducts that bile would travel through after it's made in the liver and as it's going to the gallbladder for storage. So bile gets pushed through the cystic duct and into the gallbladder when it's time for storage. And then when there is when there are lipids 
uh, that are present in the duodenum, that triggers the release of a, a hormone, which we'll talk about more later on. It's called CCK cholecystokinin, is its long name. Cholecystokinin will travel through the blood vessels to the gallbladder, initiate contraction of the gallbladder so that the bile that is stored there gets pushed out of the cystic duct. And because it's needed for digestion, it doesn't travel upwards. It follows the force of gravity downwards, down the common bile duct. And the common bile duct will meet the pancreatic duct, duct for a little bit and together open up to a certain segment, certain opening of the duodenum, which you're going to want to know. It's called the duodenal ampulla. It is also uh, known as simply the ampulla. Uh, and the section that had basically is the convergence of the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct is known as the hepatopancreatic duct. There's a sphincter at the opening or the ampulla. It's called the sphincter of Odi. This controls what's coming out of this hepatopancreatic duct so that we can regulate the release of bile and digestive enzymes from the gallbladder and pancreas respectively. Now we're gonna move on to uh, several cells or hormones that are secreted by enteroendocrine cells. So entero meaning intestine, endocrine meaning it's a hormone and it's got a, it needs access to a bloodstream to uh, travel to where it needs to go. We will start with secretin. This hormone is released when uh, chyme that's coming from the stomach, uh, which had a pH of 2.0, so very acidic. Therefore, this chyme is acidic. When this acidic chyme arrives in the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, this will trigger the release of secretin. This will increase uh, buffering bases by the liver and the pancreas to help increase the pH of that acidic chyme. Also secreted by the duodenum, especially when there is a high amount of lipid found in the chyme is cholecystokinin, abbreviated CCK. This is the one that I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the gallbladder. This one will uh, contract the gallbladder so that bile can be released uh, so they can travel down the common bile duct to enter the duodenum to help emulsify those fatty acids in chyme. Now, in high concentrations of CCK uh, release, we now know that this has an effect on the central nervous system, especially the areas of the central nervous system uh, that reduce the sensation of hunger. Uh, and something I want to add here from a pragmatic standpoint, because the ketogenic diet has gotten a lot of rap recently, uh, a lot of patients who do the ketogenic diet successfully, they do it right. Uh, they're eating the right types of fat-based foods. Uh, often reports a positive side effect of decreased uh, hunger. And the premise behind that is CCK. In a ketogenic diet, you are consuming a high amounts of lipid compared to protein, very limited carbohydrates. And because the release of cholecystokinin, CCK, it has a dose dependent relationship with respect to how much lipid is present in the duodenum, the more fatty acids you consume in your food, the more CCK you produce. And the more CCK you produce, the more likely it will have an effect on those hunger spots, hunger regions in the central nervous system, which uh, actually helps these patients because a lot of them are on the ketogenic diet because they want to lose weight sustainably. So, You've got a process, uh, essentially hormones working to your advantage. Uh, I am also going to put in a quick plug for anyone out there who uh, is on the ketogenic diet to make sure that you are properly monitored by a physician because uh, you want to make sure you're doing it right and you really should be testing electrolytes and lipid levels pretty regularly. 
Now, uh, nothing new here on the slide. This is just for you. If you are a visual learner, CCK is released in the presence of lipids in the duodenum to release uh, to trigger the release of bile from the gallbladder. The next hormone we're gonna talk about is gastric inhibitory peptide, often abbreviated GIP. When fats and carbohydrates, specifically glucose, enter the duodenum, uh, it is secreted. So what GIP will do is it will facilitate the release of insulin from uh, the pancreas, specifically the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans that are in the pancreas. This is also known as glucose dependent insulinotropic peptide. That is a mouthful. I will say the GIP may appear as either or both names or its abbreviation on Wednesday. So be sure that you are familiar with all its synonyms. Now, gastrin. Gastrin is secreted by G cells in the duodenum. There are also G cells in the gastric pits of the stomach. In the stomach, G cells secrete gastrin to help with the production of hydrochloric acid by the parietal cells its role in the duodenum is slightly different. So in the duodenum, G cells will secrete gastrin to um, increase stomach motility. And really this is to help with mechan to facilitate some mechanical uh, physical digestion of chyme in the duodenum. Uh, what will trigger the release of gastrin in the duodenum are, uh, uh, partially digested proteins. So recall in the oral cavity, there were no enzymes to break proteins down. The first uh, set of proteins, uh, first set of enzymes that we saw that started to break down proteins was in the stomach. They were released by uh, the chief cells. Pepsinogen was the proenzyme. It's gotta be activated to pepsin. That is what will start breaking down proteins. So whatever is left over from the work that pepsin did on these proteins will move to the duodenum and trigger the release of gastrin by the G cells. And this will increase stomach motility. Now, now, um, keep in mind that digestion is a two part, uh, basically two parts to digestion. There's a chemical type of digestion, uh, and then there's the physical uh, part of digestion. So anything that physically moves food contents or what was food contents is going to fall under the physical digestion category. What gastrin also do is stimulate more acid and enzyme production to essentially perpetuate the release of all the enzymes and hormones that will make sure digestion in the duodenum reaches complete near completion, if not completion, because remember the duodenum is the section of the small intestine that is most responsible for the digestion and absorption of these nutrients. This is a really neat summary slide for you, especially if you are a visual learner, it puts everything together. I'm gonna to move on to the hepatic portal system for the sake of time. So at the core of the hepatic portal system is the hepatic portal vein. One more time, at the core of the hepatic portal system is the hepatic portal vein seen right here. The hepatic portal vein is not the same as the hepatic vein. The hepatic portal vein will shunt nutrients that were absorbed from the duodenum and direct it to the liver where it can get activated so that we can maximize the nutrition that we are consuming in our food. That leads us to a discussion on the liver. On this slide is a summary, not exhaust, uh, not by all means all comprehensive list of what the liver does, but this slide does a good job of highlighting its main points or its main functions. The liver does so much, it really is an underappreciated organ, in my opinion. Um, and so anything that we can do to help the liver uh, 
function as best as possible is it, that is really associated with overall wellness. So let's uh, highlight a, uh, some key items because you might be asked about them on Wednesday. Uh, first and foremost, uh, stemming from our conversation on glucagon and uh, how the body responds to, responds to a period of hypoglycemia, so low glucose in the blood, typically uh, a situation you'll find yourself in if you have been fasting or if you've woken up um, after a nice long sleep, uh, you, you will temporarily be in a state of low blood glucose. So alpha cells in the endocrine pancreas will be released. Uh, will we'll release glucagon and glucagon will go to the liver where there is lots of glucose stored in the form of glycogen. So the liver is important for carbohydrate metabolism because it will undergo gluconeogenesis to make glucose molecules from stored glycogen molecules. The liver is also important for waste product removal, specifically ammonia from amino acid breakdown. Um, this is converted to urea. That's something that we detect on blood work and through uh, your, your, your analysis. Uh, this stems to, uh, this is a great segue to the liver's role in detoxification. Uh, now, Detoxification has several meanings uh, from a medication perspective. Something we have to always think about when we dose medications is uh, how it passes or how it's inactivated by the liver and how fast. Also, how it's excreted through the kidneys. In any case, uh, this is one of the main reasons for why patients really should not be adjusting their own medication doses. Just and a lot of patients fortunately do that because if they're not feeling well and they want to feel well fast, they, they, they tinker with their doses. Uh, and when I have a conversation with my patients, I explain why I say, well, uh, unless you have a sound understanding of how these medications are inactivated or metabolized by the liver, you may potentially be causing more harm than you are good for your body because the liver has a role in detoxification and that has significant implications for the way medications are metabolized in the body. Please keep in mind that the liver is responsible for mineral storage, especially iron. This is why iron is a really good, or sorry, the liver is really good source of iron. It just tastes a little uh, peculiar. It's, I, I, in my opinion, an acquired taste, uh, but uh, something that I would recommend to patients who are uh, have a tendency towards iron deficiency because there's really lots of iron if, in liver, animal liver, if they, if they can handle the taste. Lots of cool tricks that you can uh, use to cook with, cook with liver to get that nice iron, uh, iron, nice iron content. The liver is important for the storage of fat soluble vitamins and vitamin B12. I would know what the fat soluble vitamins are because there's only really four of them. The uh, acronym is ADEK, stands for vitamin E, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. The liver is the largest blood reservoir in the body. That's important to know. Um, we will, when we talked about how red blood cells are recycled, the liver was a part of that conversation. And we are going to revisit that just a little bit because uh, it, is, it is an important role uh, of the liver. No one else really, the spleen a little bit, but no other organ can do what the liver does with respect to how we recycle red blood cells. So what the liver does is it will screen the blood that's coming in for red blood cells that um, are uh, basically uh, growing old and senile. Uh, if you recall, red blood, mature red blood cells only really hang out in the bloodstream for 120 days. And after, as it reaches the 120 day mark uh, or is past the 120 day mark, it starts to look a little bit different. That's filtered out by the liver so that we can, so that it can break down break it down to its content so that we can use those constituents to make uh, new, uh, fresh, younger red blood cells, which will be, a, which will do a whole lot better in terms of oxygen transportation throughout the blood. 
All right, moving right along here. Don't forget that the small intestine comes before the large intestine. The small intestine has three regions, DJI, like the Dow Jones Index, stock market entity, if you follow the stock market, is the acronym that I use. So from beginning to end, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. That's for small intestine. What we're gonna talk about now is the large intestine. The large intestine is also referred to as the colon. Something I wanna make uh, known to everybody, make sure we're on the same page is, uh, cause I've seen this a lot. So uh, lar a common deductive or common comment I hear is, well, since large intestine is synonymous with colon, then small intestine it is, is also like you can refer to the small intestine as small colon. Not quite the case. Small intestine is just small intestine and it's three regions. Uh, large intestine is also known as the colon and vice versa. Uh, there's no really no other way we can refer to the small intestine as a whole. So I mentioned this because there is actually a, a syndrome known as small colon syndrome, which has, which has nothing to do with the small intestine. So um, a brief anatomy review. Here we have got the large intestine. If you're following my cursor, I, I am showing you, and it's in a clockwise direction, the direction in which feces will move throughout the colon. Uh, highlight that because when we remember this, then we can appropriately name the segments of the large intestine because the first part that the, uh, uh, that the what will be feces sees is the cecum that begins the large intestine, and then it travels upwards first in the ascending colon, then along the transverse plane, that would be the transverse colon, and then it descends in the, or moves downwards in the descending colon, and then it curves into this S-like structure called the zygmoid colon, and then it passes through the rectum, and then out the opening called the anus, and go, it goes, and that's the other end of the digestive tract. So the anus, the opening uh, that is on the inferior end of the rectum is the whole reason for why the digestive system is open to the external environment on both ends, the mouth at the oral cavity and the anus at the rectum. So let's talk about the flexures. The flexure is gonna be any part of the colon where the, where the colon curves. So there's three in total, one on the patient's right side, that will be the right colic flexure, and then one on the patient's left side, the left colic flexure. These are also named based on the organ that's located in the same quadrant. So in the right upper quadrant is the liver. For that reason, the right colic flexure is also known as the hepatic flexure. And then in the left upper quadrant is where you'll find the spleen. And so the left colic flexure is also known as the splenic flexure. Your third and final flexure is the sigmoid flexure right here. It basically is at the end of the descending colon as, you, as it becomes the sigmoid colon. This one has one and only one name. This is the sigmoid flexure. By the time the or the what was food matter enters a large intestine, most uh, digestion and absorption of nutrients have already occurred. Because remember, that happens in the small intestine. So the large intestine's main role is to reabsorb as much water as possible in the digestive juices, which is water based. Uh, more than 90% of water is reabsorbed in the large intestine. And so it's really important that uh, so what will be feces travels at a certain rate because if it's too traveling too fast, this is the problem in diarrhea, then uh, you're not absorbing enough water. Uh, and then if uh, water, if the feces is moving too slow in the large intestine, then this will typically result in constipation uh, because too much water is absorbed from the would-be feces. Here is an image of a colon. You can see where the stool is. Looks like this patient is struggling with some degree of constipation based on the amount of stool that's present here. Other than the 90% uh, of water that the 
large intestine reabsorbs. It also reabsorbs uh, bile salts in the cecum specifically. So that's the first part of the large intestine. And that's the bile salts will be transported to the liver by the blood so that it can be used again. Recall that the liver makes bile and it's stored in the gallbladder. There are, uh, there are good bacteria that live in the large intestine. We've known this for quite some time. It's kind of the premise behind taking a probiotic. Uh, what we often don't realize is that this bacteria actually helps with the absorption of certain vitamins. They're listed for you uh, on a slide later on. The one we like to ask about is vitamin K. So that's worth taking ex uh, an extra note on. The large intestine, in addition to water and bile, will absorb organic waste, specifically bilirubin. Um, bilirubin will, will be converted to urobilinogen, which will be excreted in the urine, so we can detect that in a urinalysis. More on that in the urinary system. For now, um, keep in mind that bilirubin is made by the liver. It's a byproduct of recycling red blood cells. Uh, and it will be absorbed in the large intestine. In the large intestine, well, we're gonna hone in now on the gut bacteria. You are not responsible for all the strains. Just know that E. coli is the main one. The reason why is because uh, it's part of the reason for why no one should really be handling feces. Uh, without proper personal protection. E. coli is very contagious. It travels through the fecal oral route. And so if you, for whatever reason, are holding it with your hands and you uh, didn't clean, wash your hands uh, and you ate something, it can pass through your digestive system, find a way to colonize in your large intestine and cause havoc there. The gut bacteria produces certain vitamins, vitamin K and vitamin B5 and B7. Vitamin K is a water soluble vitamin. Vitam all the B vitamin, sorry, let me backtrack. Vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin. Vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin. Recall that the liver has a role in regulating fat soluble vitamins. All the B vitamins, all the B vitamins are water soluble. The ones, uh, so there's several B vitamins and that's typically, this is typically what you see in a vitamin B complex supplement is B1, B2, B3, B5, B6, B7, B9, and B12. Uh, the bacteria that's in the colon makes specifically vitamin B5 and vitamin B7. Those are worth knowing really well. Moving on now to organic waste. Bacteria will convert bilirubin to urobilinogen and stercobilinogens. Urobilinogen will be excreted through the urine. It gets to the urine uh, by the bloodstream. Now, it's these compounds are important because this will explain the color that feces typically has, and that's a yellow, brown, brown. So uh, because a lot of my clinical practice is focused on um, gastrointestinal health and autoimmunity, um, a common question that, that I ask my patients is, you know, a lot of questions about their stool, which freaks them out at first, uh, but really stool is like a really easy test. Ideally, you're going at least once a day, unless you're constipated, at which point we'll be addressing that anyway. But I can, I can, we can deduce a lot about digestive health based on how frequently you're having a bowel movement, the shape of your stool, what color your stool is, and other fluid that is coming that that the feces presents with, like blood and mucus, are the two main uh, fluids that come with feces that tend to cause problems. In any case, I bring this up because when patients say, you know, I have stool color that is not brown, then I have to start thinking about what's going on with the liver. Because part of the reason for why stool is brown is because of bilirubin, because bilirubin is metabolized in the liver. That could be an early indicator that the liver needs help. And the sooner I can find what the issue is, the better off my patient is. 
This is review uh, of how blood, red blood cells are recycled. So you wanna focus on what is happening at the liver. Keyword here is gonna be bilirubin. So recall that at the red blood cells are filled with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has a heme group at the center with uh, an iron ion. Each hemoglobin has four globin chains, two alpha, two beta. The heme group is uh, taken out of the, uh, detaches from the globin chain by the macrophages that are in the spleen, liver, and bone marrow. When that happens, heme will get converted to biliverdin, then bilirubin. Liver, the liver will metabolize bilirubin, and it's excreted in bile, travels through the large intestine, and then it, the, in the large intestine is where it will be converted to urobilin and stercobilin, which will explain uh, why feces has a yellow-brown-brown brown color, and then that is eliminated in the feces. Couple of other organic wastes that are found in feces uh, that are come now from the that are a, a result of bacteria breaking down peptides or proteins are ammonia, that's a big one, hydrogen sulfide. That's an, that's one worth knowing because this will explain that uh, funky smell that resembles a rotten egg. And then indole and scatol, which is a nitrogen compound that will contribute to uh, the odor of feces as well. So as you may have experienced, not all feces will have a rotten egg odor. Uh, and in fact, the odor of feces can typically, especially if it's really strong and the patient reports it in their clinical intake, that is a clue for me with respect to how likely there is an imbalance in the bacteria that's typically found in the large intestine. What bacteria will feed on are indigestible carbohydrates. Uh, I highlight this because uh, when there's lots of indigestible carbohydrates, like that found in beans, it will basically be the reason for why the bacteria in the large intestine are having a party. And it produces a lot of gas, which in the medical community we refer to when uh, note down as flatus. Uh, it essentially will come out of the anus if it, you know, if it makes its way to the anus and make some really silly sounds. I hope you are understanding what I'm trying to get at here. Uh, let's talk about the appendix, which is a structure that hangs off of the cecum. Okay, this is in the right lower quadrant. Uh, forget it's there and, and, until it's inflamed and it uh, wreaks havoc. So for uh, this is a vestigial organ. Um, so meaning it really doesn't do much of anything for us, though more and more research uh, more and more current research is showing the role of uh, the appendix in protecting against autoimmunity because there are lots of lymphoid, no lymphoid nodules in the appendix. Um, please know that the appendix is more formally known as the vermiform appendix. Some students think, oh, well, there's an appendix and there's a vermiform appendix. No, no, there's just one appendix. Um, and it's known as the vermiform appendix. It's just easier to say appendix. So this one is a is the culprit uh, uh, in appendicitis. Presents with right lower quadrant discomfort and pain. The patient also complains of a fever or has a fever and has chills and weakness. That is a priority pass to the ER and then the OR, because we are gonna to wanna to take it out before it potentially ruptures, look how big this is, potentially ruptures and creates a case of septic shock, widespread shock for the patient, which will be a whole lot more difficult to manage. So appendicitis is a big red flag. It is essentially inflammation of the appendix. You want to catch it before it ruptures to uh, maximize the prognosis for your patients.
In the large intestine, there are certain reflexes that will move materials into the cecum. This is the gastroileal and gastroenteric reflex. Uh, every time you eat, this will initiate the reflex. This will explain why some patients will uh, say that every time they, that, that they often have a bowel movement after they have a certain meal of the day. Typically, in my experience, um, not just personal, but definitely professional, uh, is that that is the morning bowel movement, so after, after breakfast. Now, movement from the cecum, so at the beginning of the large intestine, to the transverse colon is very slow. We want this so we can maximize water absorption. Um, the gastrocolic reflex is the urge to defecate after a big meal. So you're going to want to know uh, which reflexes are more likely to activate based on what trigger. The reasoning behind the gastrocolic reflex is, well, if you uh, had a big meal uh, and they digest, there's only so much space in the digestive system, you need to make more room to allow for the contents of this big meal to make its way through the digestive tract. Just like all other parts of the digestive system, the movement of uh, the contraction of smooth muscles in peristaltic waves is responsible for, uh, for what will be feces moving along the large intestine. The concept of segmentation is facilitated by the presence of house strap, which is essentially those pouches that you find in the large intestine. Every time in each house strap, there is mixing of contents with the house strap next to it. The segmentation comes from the uh, way the house strap literally segments uh, the feces that will that is passing through the large intestine. And here is a clockwise direction by which we want feces to move throughout the large intestine. The image on the bottom left hand of this slide here will uh, essentially show you the connection or the connection of the reflexes. Uh, so you this is essentially for all my visual learners, this is for you. Let's talk about the defecation reflex. So uh, the def defecation is how we refer to uh, pooping in the medical community. That's what we that's what we record in chart notes. Um, now, when feces enters the sigmoid colon, which is that last segment here, it will initiate the defecation reflex. It's a reflex, obviously, right? Because you'd be going about your day, and then before you know it, you feel that urge. You feel that urge to go to the bathroom and do number two. So uh, all of this is heavily uh, driven by the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system specifically, there is an internal and an external anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is mediated by the autonomic nervous system. The rectal, sorry, the external anal sphincter is mediated by the uh, skeletal system. We have more control over the external than we do the internal, which is a good thing. Otherwise, um, it would be a, a mess all the time if you catch what I'm trying to get at here. Incontinence is a, is a clinical syndrome in which a patient has lost the ability to control how to or when and how to excrete bodily fluids, including uh, urine and feces. I want to highlight the Bristol stool chart here. You will not see this on your uh, celebration of learning on Wednesday. I just want to point it out because this basically is what I use in my clinical practice to uh, help understand uh, what uh, what patient's stool looks like. Uh, one, sometimes, I mean, talking about society has made us a little uh, shy about talking about feces. And so sometimes it's just a whole lot easier to have them point to which of these seven types does your stool most look like. And from there, I can deduce several things, including what my working diagnoses are and what tests I need to order to confirm my diagnosis. Uh, 
There's really nothing I need to add about diarrhea. The main point here is that diarrhea, as a reminder, is a result of feces moving throughout the large intestine um, to, to, uh, too fast. And so not enough water is being reabsorbed by the large intestine, meaning more fluid, more water is exiting with feces out the anus. And the, the ramifications that the clinical ramifications that come from this is the, you know, the more a patient has diarrhea, the, they will have a harder time with um, maintaining good water, good hydration. And so you might want to start thinking about giving them a, a hydration, a hydration IV or uh, an electrolyte IV to help them regulate electrolytes uh, a little bit better until we figure out the cause of the diarrhea and treat that. And that folks is the end of the digestive system. Are there any questions I can answer for you all before I let you all go for the weekend? I actually have a question. Yes, Jumana. What's your question? So, um, you know how you mentioned that the more water it is, the more constipated you are, and then vice versa. Can you explain that to me? 